The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Caesar said it. Let me have fat men around me. A fat cat is a contented cat. Fat people are jolly people. Sure. We know all the old cliches, don't we? Including everybody loves a fat man. But does everybody love a fat girl? Not, it would seem, from this. Get up. I must get up. I mustn't wake anyone. Not the elevator. The stairs. I have to go to the roof. The roof. Here I am. No more bad dreams. A whole new world for me. Just have to step off and fly. Step off and fly. Our mystery drama, Happy Death Day, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Contact the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value hardware stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Dreams. Waking and sleeping, they are so much a part of all our lives. No problem in understanding the daydreams, the idle fancies and rosy wishes we would like to fulfill or have fulfilled, but what of the others, the ones that come unbidden in our sleep, the terrors of the night that haunt us like specters and bring us awake, blood drained by fear, the silent scream distending the throat. Is there any explanation for them, any reason, and uh, can they forecast the future, even a person's death? No, oh no, no, please, please, oh, I, 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 I can't stand this, it. killing me, my ears, yeah, March. Uh, uh, March. March, honey, what is it? Oh, is oh, that you? Well, of course, oh. who else? And in our own bed. Hold me, hold me, I'm terrified, it's so dark, it's so dark. Now, wait a minute. Uh, uh, now, that uh, takes care of being in the dark. Uh, now, come here, come here, come uh, closer. There. Now, how's that? Mm. Honey, what is it? You're shaking all over. I'm scared out of my life. Another dream. No, no, Paul. This wasn't just another dream. This was a perfect, horrible, special dream. Paul, I'm going to die. Well, who isn't? <laughs> what are you talking about, die? I dreamt it. I know it. Dreams don't mean anything. This one did. How? Because it told me when I'm going to die. Well, then maybe you better tell me about it. Only two things about the dream. Uh, what, what you'd say, you know, factual, I guess. I mean, they were totally clear, unmistakable. What, Marge? That it was just before midnight and that it was my 28th birthday. Well, it doesn't seem so frightening. I didn't talk about the third thing, which I hope isn't real. At midnight was the exact moment that I died. Died? Yes. Oh, Paul. Honey, do I have to talk about it? I think I'd like, I'd, I'd like to... To forget it. Yeah, but you know what I'd really like? You just name it. I'd like to... Just go down to the kitchen and have some cocoa or chocolate or... Maybe I could make you a little snack. There's some Danish left from this morning. 
And we'll just pretend I never dreamed what I dreamed. Honey, it's late. I have an early morning, you oh, know. Oh, come on. Wouldn't be the first time we stayed up late. That was before we were married. Does that make it so different now? No, of course not. All right, come on. Let's go have a midnight snack, and you can turn me to quivering jelly while you tell me about your nightmare. You sure you wouldn't like a little mocha cream cake? No, thanks, dear. Well, all you had was coffee. Which I'm out of my mind to be having at one o'clock in the morning. Ah, then why did you have it? I just wanted to keep you company. <laughs> um, Marge? Mm-hmm? You're not going to eat any more cake or stuff, hmm? Why not? You think it isn't good for me? No, I, I didn't say that. I just meant... Look, I don't want to get involved tonight. Just drink your chocolate and eat that gooey cake and let's get back to bed. Hmm? I don't think you're being very fair. Well, neither do I, but uh, I'm just tired. Now, why can't we go back to sleep? Because I'm scared to go to sleep. That's why. Because of the nightmare? Yes. Come on, now, baby. Be reasonable. It was just a dream. How bad could it be? Well, so far, you haven't cared enough to be interested. I'm sorry. I did ask you to tell me about it. A little more than that, hubby love. You suggested that I turn you into a quivering jelly while I related it. <laughs> Okay, convert me to aspic right now. Oh, I wish I thought there was anything funny about it. But I don't. No gags, no cracks. Now lay it on me quietly. What did you dream? I was in this place. It was dark and shadowy. It, the sort of space where there are only elevators and stairs. I mean, staircases going up. The elevators weren't running, and so you had to go up the stairs. But first off, you had to go down a long, dark corridor. And then there was the door, and the staircases began. And you started climbing, because you knew that something was behind you, treading on your heels, ready to smother you, kill you. And then the panic began, because it was getting closer and closer. So I started climbing faster. But no matter how many stairs I climbed, there were more and more. And no matter how fast I climbed, the steps came closer and closer. And then, at last, I was on a high place where you could look out over the world. I was no longer closed in. But that presence, it, it was right behind me. If I had to escape, I'd have to run back down all those steps that went on forever and ever or, or, or jump. All the way down to the distant lights below. So I turned to face whoever it was that was dogging my heels. <laughs> so terrifying because whoever it was, he had no face. Everything else was a man. But no face. And he kept coming towards me. He was like a leper. I couldn't bear to have him touch me. So what else was there left for me to do but to jump? And did you? What? Jump. In my dream. Well, of course. What else? I don't know. That's when I woke up. And now you're safe. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, darling. You had a bad dream, but you're awake now. Yeah. The lights are on, and you're in your husband's arms. Val, I don't know how much longer I can stand it. Poor Paul. I know my sister is a trial. A trial? She gorges herself on cake and candy. She's blown up like a balloon. And now all this dream nonsense. I have to hold her and croon over her like some lovesick mother with her first baby. Makes me gag. Well, how do you think it makes me feel? The two of you in bed? Well, she is my wife. Only as long as I keep quiet about us. All right, you don't have to remind me. Paul, our relationship may be very close, but it isn't exactly founded on trust. I'm not trying to double-cross you. Well, you better not. Save it for my dear half-sister, who better not be your wife any longer than a month from today. Valerie, have a heart. Let me hang a little loose. No. The moment the money is legally hers, I want you to deliver on your promise. I haven't figured out a way yet. Well, you better. For 28 years, I have hated that soft, blue-eyed, fat little phony. She smommed around my father, all oh, lovey-dovey, she and her mother. Well, I got the Cinderella treatment, even though I was the first. 
Just because my father hated my mother and never forgave her for, for divorcing him, I had to take the blame. And Marge and that harpy who gave my father his favorite child made sure I never had a chance. All right, all right, Val. We've been over all of that before. Oh, I just have this feeling, lover, that we need to keep going over it. Now, why are you suddenly ducking the issue? Valerie, this... This attempt to control dreams is a new world for me. According to you, it was simple. The game of dreams. Wasn't that your phrase? That under hypnosis it was possible to suggest what a person might dream? I believe it is. And I'm not without some medical support for that belief. So? You already have her dreaming about dying on her birthday. Isn't it working? Not exactly. Why? Because we have to establish a pattern. I can't get her to walk in her sleep yet. Now, if that were set up, then she could die without suspicion. I mean, it's a lot of money, isn't it? It's worth any kind of a risk. But it's also worth being very careful about making sure that we get it the right way. Very well, Paul. How do we proceed now? I gave you the name of Madame Nadia Kiryalov from my old carnival days. Mm -hmm. Try to get Marge to go to her. She's made herself quite a name as an interpreter of dreams, tarot card reader, diviner of the future, and so on. Now, I don't want the suggestion to come from me. You try to coax Marge to go to her. It shouldn't be too difficult. All right. But why? Just contributory evidence. I'll program Nadja on what to say. Oh, does she have to be included? Oh, honey, she won't know what's involved. Just a favor for an old carny friend. She'll play it just the way I ask. She owes me a few favors. Oh, oh. <laughs> just bet she does, and vice versa. Not what you think, Tiger. Nadja's at least 80. And if she turned out to be 102, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, will you just steer Marge her way? Did Paul leave? Yes, I think so. He, he said something about a luncheon appointment. Oh, yes, that's business. He thinks it'll be a job offer. Oh, good. Uh, I'll make you some fresh coffee if you like. I, I didn't make any more because I thought you were still asleep. No, I couldn't sleep. I was afraid. Afraid of what, Marge? Oh, afraid I might dream it again. Oh, come on. What's so scary about dreams? Now, let me make you some nice hot coffee. That'll wash away the cobwebs. No, not these cobwebs. Not this dream. What does it mean when you dream you're going to die, Val? Well, nothing. Dreams don't always mean something. But wouldn't it mean something to you if you dreamed that in just about a month on your birthday, you were going to die? Why would I dream a thing like that? What does it mean? Oh, Marge, how, how can I tell? But there are people who, well, you know, read dreams, sort of, I don't know, divine what they're all about. I wish I knew someone like that. Someone I could go to. I'm so... Well, there's a box of chocolates on the table. Hand them to me, will you? Oh, sure. Uh, but shouldn't you... I know, I know. I eat too many, but it helps me to calm down. It's like smoking, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, th there's this girl who works at the office with me. She was having all these terrible dreams, and they were giving her migraine headaches. And then somehow she found out about a Madame Kiryalov. Mm -hmm. Well, she's kind of a, a, a seer-like. And, and she can read dreams and explain them so you understand and you don't have to be afraid of them. Where is she? Where can I get to see her? Well, I could find out from my friend. Oh, oh wait a minute, wait a minute. I think she gave me a card. I I'll go look for it. You think she could tell me I wasn't going to die? Oh, she... She might. But supposing she told me that my dream was going to come true. Oh, well, she'd never do a thing like that, even if... If it was? Oh, well, just the same, I think I'd like to go and find out. Now, here's a nice, complex, tangled web to untangle before we get to the end of our fiction. A girl threatened by money. Murder and madness, any one of which may lead her to her doom before her approaching birthday. Will it instead turn out to be her death day? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Somebody, sooner or later, is always saying something familiar. And usually more than once. Certainly this old saw is well worn by now. It's all in the point of view. We're already pretty well acquainted with Paul and Valerie's point of view, so 
Let's examine Marge's a little more closely. Or rather, listen to her examine it herself. I've always been fat, ever since I can remember. I guess when I was a little kid, they called me chubby. Then in my teens, it was pleasingly plump to the older people. And the boys used to say I was stacked. Once I got into the 20s, particularly after Dad died, it was overweight. Or behind my back, they just called me what I am. Fat. I eat too much candy, sweet stuff and things. I used to think it was because I've always been a loner. I don't think Mom ever really wanted me. Anyway, she died when I was 10. And it was only Dad. And when he went, I... Yes, I would have been lost if it hadn't been for Paul. He was so sweet from the first time I ever met him. Oh, here he is now. Paul? Oh, Paul. Hi, Valerie. Oh, could you come over for a minute? Well, that's an offer too good to turn down. <laughs> well, you're too good to believe. I only aim to please. Oh, <laughs> I don't know whether I'm doing you a favor, Marge, or just making trouble, but uh, this crazy guy is Paul Werner. Well, I'll admit to the name, but not the nature. Hi. Hi, Mr. Werner. Uh, Paul, this is my little sister. I've told you so, so much about Marge. Well, not so little. Oh, uh, <laughs> Val and I, we're, just, we're, we're half-sisters. That's why we don't look anything alike. Oh, oh, that, there's Dick Patterson. Oh, Dick! Oh, say, w would you excuse me, kids, but I've got to ask him about the dart tournament next month, do you mind? No, not at all. But I, I don't want to uh, leave you alone, Marge. She won't be alone. Not if she can stand my company. I couldn't believe it was happening. Just like in a movie or a storybook, he walked right into my life. Like that. You look lovely. <laughs> You're putting me on, Paul. Why would I do that? Oh, uh, the other night when we met, you made a crack. I, listen, I don't blame you, but, but I wasn't so little, remember? Yes. So? <laughs> well, I meant that you were very much a woman. What else did you think? I I, I thought you meant I was, well, you know, overweight. Marge, you can't believe that I would make a remark as awkward as that. I'm sorry, I don't know why I brought it up. Well, neither do I. But as long as you have, let's get one thing straight. I don't like skinny women. Oh. I love a figure that, that flaunts what it is. It says, I'm a woman, and I'm proud of it. Now, before we order dinner, would you like to dance? I'd love to. In his arms, I forgot my weight. I was floating. He was a marvelous dancer, and his body... Lean and strong against mine as he held me close. Put thoughts in my mind I was less ashamed of than thrilled by. You're marvelously light on your feet. I used to dance with my father. I always thought he was the best dancer in the world. Till now. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a professional. No, no, no. But I do love to dance. What do you do? Oh, that's a good question. I suppose I was spoiled being left so much money, but... I traveled a good deal. I became, uh... Oh, what shall I say? Jack of all trades. <laughs> but I decided to become at least master of one, so I'm a promoter. What do you promote? <laughs> that really would be a bore. It all has to do with money. It's investing, managing, finding the right tax shelters, protection of capital growth plans, you know. But that isn't anything to talk about on a romantic evening. I don't want to bore you. I want to charm you. You don't bore me. You know, in a little over a year, I'll have quite a bit of money of my own. Maybe you could help me with some kind of investment plan. Look, I couldn't care less about that. I have other plans for us in which you might share. Or will, I hope. Now, let's dance. Oh, dear. We were married six months later. Paul gave me the most beautiful engagement and wedding rings. And I promised myself that my present to him was going to be to slim down. Somehow, I never quite seem to manage, just as I never seem to be able to stop my dream. Tell me what you dream. Well, uh, Madam Kiriolov, sometimes I dream I'm in a room with this snake, and I'm afraid of him, and I run all about the room, but the walls are smooth, with no doors or windows. And the snake keeps 
writhing towards me, and then he reaches up, coiling on his tail, and just as he strikes out at me, I wake up. And that is so difficult to interpret. <laughs> he is the symbol of man, of fertility. And I think you must not be afraid. You love your husband very much, no? Yes, I do. And you would like to uh, to have his child? I suppose so. But you are a little afraid since you never had a child yet. So that is all the meaning. Now, what other dreams? Oh, there's so many. I Well, mainly the one that I came to see you about. If you can get rid of my fear about that one as easily as the others, I guess I wouldn't feel so insecure. Tell me. Well, give me a minute to kind of get hold of myself. <laughs> this one is so real, it, it's hard even to talk about it. Everything else is a man, but not a face. And he comes towards me like a leper, and I can't bear to have him touch me. So what else is there left for me to do but jump? Well, can you read that dream for me, Madame Karyalov? Mrs. Werner, I... You will forgive an old lady, but... but I... What is it? Are you ill? No, no, not, not ill. Not in the body. But... In the soul. I don't understand. There are people like myself who find paths to the supernatural. But there are others for whom there are no signs, only absolute knowledge. The true mediums, the apostles of the new truth, the future knowledge. You are one of those. And before you, I am humble. And afraid. What are you saying? That I'm going to die within the month? My dream is for telling me that? I have a splitting headache, Paul. Let me massage your neck the way I used to. Now, what's wrong, darling? It's the dream, Paul. I'm scared. I know I'm going to die. Just because of a dream? How many people dream the exact date and the exact age that they're going to die? I don't know. Darling, why don't you let me sit here facing you and persuade you to relax and forget about any fears or dreams? Just the way you've always been able to, since the beginning. I hope I can always help. Oh, Paul, you've always been able to hypnotize me. I don't claim any such magic power. It's true. Something about your voice. That strange amulet you wear around your neck with all the colored brilliance, the little slivers of mirror in it. You mean my Indian charm? Whatever it is, I love it. As I love you. Makes me feel so drowsy. <laughs> Sometimes I think it swings back and forth like a pendulum. The mark of time. Hmm. The measure of the tiny bridge we all can cross between the waking and the sleeping. I can feel all the tensions drain away. As they should. As they should. You're falling softly, softly into the transition between the conscious and the subconscious. But you I want to forget everything but the peace of being in suspension. Go to sleep. 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 Until I tell you, I don't want you to hear me when I speak again. Marge? Marge? You are asleep. All right, Val, come in. I don't want to wake her. You can't. Only I can do that. Come in. What are you going to do? You'll see. Marge? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to tell you a dream... That you are going to dream. But you will not stop to look at the man or whoever is following you, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
I won't try to see him. You will run from him because you know there is only one escape. There is only one escape. To jump. To fly free and know that you will fall to safety. I will fall to safety? Because I will be waiting to catch you. There is no danger. You will be safe. You must try it tonight. Tonight, Paul? It's too soon. Val, it's only the first of a few times. We need to set it up so that it might happen. And that no one is to blame but Marge herself. What are we going to do? Test it out. Post-hypnotic suggestion. I'm going to tell her that at 11.45 she's to get out of bed. Walk out the door and climb the stairs to the roof of the apartment house, thinking all the way of the dream, remembering it, making it come alive. Can you do that? I can try. She's very susceptible to any hypnotic suggestion. But suppose it works. I mean, suppose she gets up there and she does jump. It's too soon. I mean, she doesn't inherit if she... Don't worry. Once she moves out of bed, I'll have the doorman and the elevator man and the superintendent notified so fast there'll be no chance of anything happening except establishing an alibi for the night when it really happens. Paul, will it really work? Is it that easy? You plant the idea in her mind and she'll just jump? Wouldn't it be delightful if that's all there was to it? Of course not. You can plant any sort of an idea in the subject's head and within reason they'll follow instructions as long as it is not against their own nature or desire. Well, then what's the point of all this? But neither of us want to be arrested for murder, do we? Not together. The night it happens, we can establish an alibi. But it will only hold up if Marge's suicide is not unexpected. If it seems logical and natural. Because in order to make sure she goes off that roof and her inheritance comes to me as her husband, I'll have to be there to make sure that she doesn't hold back. Now, leave me alone. Before I bring her out of the trance, I want to induce her to dream her dream again. What is it? What is it, darling? Oh, 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 dream. That terrible dream. How did it get... Oh, Marge. Marge, dear, it's just a dream. Now, go back to sleep. Oh, thank heaven you're here to take care of me. Oh, Paul. You love me. Of course I do. I don't know how you could. I'm fat. Nobody ever loved me except me. Oh, why do I eat and eat? I don't want to be overweight. Paul, Hush, why do I... Darling, I... You're just the way I want you to be. <sighs> and it's late. You have to sleep now. Sleep. I'm so tired. What time is it? Almost quarter to twelve. Oh. Sleep, darling. Sleep. Yeah. Yes, I can now. And remember. Mm hmm? Remember. Yes, I remember. I remember. Get up. I must get up. Put on my robe. I have to go to the roof. The roof. Mustn't wake anyone. No. Not the elevator. The stairs. The stairs. And then when I climb them to the open sky, no more bad dreams. No more defeat. It's a whole new world waiting for me. All I have to do is step off and fly. Fly. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to glay, said Mr. Robert Burns. In this case, for mice, you could read rat. It's the pleasantest term I can think of for Mr. Paul Werner. And wouldn't it be the supreme irony if, in messing about in fields beyond human control, he lost not only his wife, but the fortune he so confidently expects to have in his hands without even having to wash the blood off them. I shall return shortly with Act Three. the most unforgivable of crimes is seldom planned. Most murders are committed in the heat of ungovernable rage, 
by accident, in the heat of some passion. Murder in the second degree. But first degree murder, the coldly contemplated ending of another person's life, is more complex. And the closer the final moment comes, the more exact and infallible the plans must prove to be. Yeah, superintendent speaking. This is Mr. Werner, apartment 11A. My wife is sleepwalking again. Send the elevator man to the top floor and meet me there just in case. Good Lord, you don't think... Yeah, Mr. Werner, right away. Help, Mr. Strook, quick. Her sister's with her, but... Right with you, Mr. Werner. No, 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 Marge, you can't. You're, you're asleep. You, you don't know what you're doing. I know, and I can fly... I can fly. All right, Mr. Viner, I got her. I have her, too. What? Marge. What? Marge. Marge, oh. what are you trying to do now? Wake up, darling. Come oh. on. Wake up. Well, Wake up now. Come on. Oh. oh. Where am I? What am I doing here? All right, oh, Marge. Oh. You were walking right. in your sleep again. This oh. happened before, Mr. Viner? Oh, just, just once or twice. There's nothing to worry about. Oh. She's never gotten this far before. Oh. Real dangerous with someone like... I mean... Fire laws. We have to have the doors able to be open from inside to the room. Yes, yes, I know. It, it won't happen again. We'll make sure of that. Just get us an elevator to bring her back down to the apartment. I didn't dream again that night because I never went to sleep. I was afraid to. I knew I needed help. Someone beyond even my darling Paul or my sister. Professional help. I was going to see a psychiatrist. Mrs. Werner, have you any idea why you dream this dream? No, doctor. A lady that I went to that divines dreams, you know, she... I don't. Tell me. Well, she really made me afraid. She said that my powers of divination were stronger than hers. And I could tell she believed just what I do. Mm. And that is? Within a few weeks. When I'm 28... I'm going to die. Well, let's just see if we can't change your mind. You're not your father's first child. No. Valerie was. Except by another mother. I mean, he was married before. But you were the only child your father and his second wife had. Yes. And your mother died. When? When I was just ten years old. Your father didn't remarry? No. No. He'd already been married twice. So you were an only child? Well, no. Uh, there was Val. Uh, by another mother? Yes. You were your father's only child by his second wife. The one who didn't divorce him. You were special. You were his favorite? I guess. He left you all his money, didn't he? Nothing to Valerie, your sister? Yes, that's right. <sighs> Did you feel guilty about that? No, I don't think so. Today, most of us believe that dreams are generally the result of something we've done or experienced in the past 24 to 48 hours. I don't understand. The first thing to do is to look for a literal meaning. But what if I can't find that? Then we're in the jungle. We must take each dream as it comes and try to interpret it. Well, what about my dream? I mean, the one I have again and again. I think it's wholly symbolic. How? I'm going to be very frank, Mrs. Werner. I think, subconsciously, you would like to kill yourself. Commit suicide? In order to be reborn in a new shape. The shape you would like to be. Slim, attractive to everyone, especially men. Attractive to yourself. That's all it is? A, a kind of death wish? Oh, dear me, no. You have no wish to die. Only to change. But who is the man who pursues me? The one whose face you never see? Yes. Probably your father. You loved him very much. You looked for his approval, existed on it. How many times as a little girl have you thought, I'll die if daddy doesn't like this dress, or the way I look, or what I'm doing? My visit to Dr. Stowe were beginning to be of enormous value to me. I didn't dream anymore. Didn't dream at all. And although it seemed to hurt Paul's feelings a little, I wouldn't allow him to try hypnotizing me anymore. I, I didn't want anything to interfere with my new sense of well-being. 
I was even losing weight. Mrs. Werner, I'm beginning to see quite a change in you. Thanks to you, Doctor. Inside and out. I notice you've dropped quite a few pounds. <laughs> Don't overdo the dieting. Oh, I'm not really dieting. I've just cut out sweets and cakes, you know, things like that. I find I don't need them anymore. A little security was all you needed. How about the dream? Not once since I've been coming to see you. Mm. Oh, you've taught me so much. But suddenly, two days before my birthday, I dreamt it again. All the same sweat and terror, flight, the sleepwalking, the shrouded figure, the man that would not turn and show me his face. Why did you wait so long to tell me about Paul and his hypnotizing you? I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's a very dangerous capability in untried hands. But you let him do it last night? Oh, I didn't let him. It just happened. Oh, no. Anyone can resist hypnotism if they desire. It demands cooperation. Well, I was suddenly so tired after dinner. I don't know why. And Paul seemed so hurt that I hadn't let him help me. You know, he doesn't know that I'm seeing you. Yes. And so you had the dream again. Yes. Do you think there's any connection? I don't know. I only know that no one should try to practice hypnotism who is unschooled and an amateur. If I bring in my nurse, would you consent to allow me to try to hypnotize you? Why? I want to set a certain fixed idea in your mind. That if you should dream this dream again, before you make any final step, you will demand to see the hooded figure's face to expose your nemesis. That you will wake up and see it for what it is. You can do that? I can try. And further, I want to remind you of something. No one who seriously wants to resist can be hypnotized or programmed to do anything beyond his own will. Happy birthday, dear mom. Go ahead, darling. Blow out the candle. Oh, and don't forget to make a wish. The wish I can handle. I don't know about this candle. <laughs> but here it goes. Hooray! Oh, you missed <laughs> one. <laughs> well, maybe that's to grow on. Huh? Anyway, happy birthday, darling. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks, both of you. Today's the day I finally came into my own. A little late, oh, but better late than never. Isn't that the truth? Oh, have some of your birthday cake. It's just your style. Coconut marshmallow with lovely fudge sauce. Oh, I think I'll pass it up. I am suddenly so sleepy. Well, it was a long day. What with the lawyers and the bankers. But my inheritance, money, that shouldn't tire a person out, should it? Well, I promise you from now on it won't. Now that you've put me in charge of it all. It's what you wanted, isn't it? Well, somebody has to keep track. And there's nobody better than Paul where so much is at stake. Don't I know it? Oh, Val, I wonder if you mind. I think I'd like to go to sleep. Oh, no, of course not, darling. I shouldn't be here tonight. I shouldn't even be cluttering up your lovebird's apartment. <laughs> well, off you go. I think I will. You don't have to come now, Paul. Oh, but I will, darling. Be right with you as soon as I finish my coffee. Good night, my dearest. And closest. Sleep well. We all set. It will be tonight. If it goes right. I've given it a sedative. I'll have to leave you now to make sure that I put the post-hypnotic suggestion in her mind. I just go to bed. No, no. You stay up doing the dishes, apparently. At 11.45, the pattern I've set, she'll go up to the roof. I'll follow her, and this time we'll be alone. One push. And she's gone. Then I'll be back down here with you, helping with the dishes. When she's found, we'll be cleaning up after a birthday party, thinking she went to bed. Get up. I must get up. Put on my robe. I have to go to the roof. The roof.
to fly. Why don't you jump? Help me. Help me. All right. If it has to be that way. But it won't be the way you wanted it. Fly yourself. Oh, sorry, Paul. I didn't want to wake up and see your face. Of all people. But thank God I woke up in time. Doctor, did you really know about Paul? Only a suspicion, albeit an educated one. Were you asleep or awake when it happened? I don't know. I only know I forgot about flying and remembered what you asked me to do. Mm. Because it was in your own interest. Yes. I turned, and I saw the face of death. <laughs> the man who should have wanted to wish me happy birthday. But thought only of it as happy death day. A little more to add. The story is told. Mr. Shakespeare said, We are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. Not quite Marge's experience. All she needed was to wake up to life. And apparently that she has done. I'll be back shortly. When I spin my tales, I seldom offer you a happy ending. For the fabric of life is a wild game of chance, which promises nothing but what you reach and strive for. And all of us need some part of the element of luck. In Marge Werner's case, it was a dedicated psychiatrist named Dr. Stowe who steered her carefully through the wilderness of the mind. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Mandel Kramer, Carol Titel, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>